Hey everyone, we are doing a special giveaway to celebrate our one year anniversary of the podcast. That's right, Fishing the DMV is one year old. It's pretty exciting. And to celebrate the occasion, we're giving away a fishing trip with Travis Eden of Kingfisher Guide Services. He operates out of the Shenandoah River and the Upper Potomac River. And we're giving you four unique ways that you can try to win an opportunity to fish with him. Number one, all online orders with Jake's Bait and Tackle. Go to Jake's Bait and Tackle website, whatever you order, in the comments section of your order, just put the hashtag fishing the DMV and you enter a chance to win. Number two, all orders in person. Just go to the store and say you'd like to enter the contest. Again, hashtag fishing the DMV. That's two ways. Number three, if you don't have any money, if you're one of my younger audience, because I know I have a lot of kids that listen to the podcast, I'm giving you two ways that you can do it that's absolutely free. Go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review of Fishing the DMV podcast. And at the end of your review, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV and you had a chance to win. Now, I'm going to give you a fourth way that you can enter the competition. On every video that drops from November 15th to December 15th, every new video that, that's on the channel, in the comments section, just put the hashtag Fishing the DMV. Now, here's a caveat. It's every video. So if you miss one video, I'm not going to be able to count you but it's free. All you got to do is in every new video from November 15th to December 15th in the comment section, just leave the hashtag fishing the DMV and you have a chance to win. So four ways, if you want to make an order online and leave the hashtag fishing the DMV, go to Jake's bait and tackle in person and tell them hashtag fishing the DMV. Number three, leave a review of the podcast on Apple podcast with the hashtag fishing the DMV. And number four on every new video that drops from December I'm sorry, from November 15th to December 15th, leave the hashtag fishing the DMV in the comment section, and that gives you four unique opportunities to win. The contest winner will be announced Saturday, December 17th at Jake's Bait and Tackle's All Day Christmas Seminar Bash. Again, contest winner will be announced December 17th, that Saturday, at Jake's Bait and Tackle's Christmas Seminar Bash. Good luck. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens, and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens, and today I have Jason Paul in the studio. Uh, he was really kind enough to, to come on in here, driving from the land, the long, long lost world of uh, Deep Creek Lake in Maryland. <laughs> um, and we're gonna have a really good conversation today. And just to try to tie into what we were just talking about was really about COVID um, and about how that changed the fisheries and stuff. And I did a live stream on Wednesday night and it was talking about the catchway release stuff. Um, and, and my thoughts on it was basically, I'm talking from a pure business standpoint from the MLF, seeming like they're going to go away from it. I'm not trying to get in the, into the conversation of whether you should do it or not do it. I just meant that they were a business that decided to go this certain route and them completely doing a 180 on that feels like it's really going to hurt their, their following. Uh, but one other comment I made that got some heat online was the fact that there are no new lakes and there's more and more pressure. And this kind of ties into um, our conversation right now with seeing how COVID has affected Deep Creek and how there's more pressure on that in Smith Mountain Lake. Unless we start building new lakes, like that catchway release might have to become a thing because I don't see Deep Creek having 300 boat tournaments like Kentucky Lake. No. You know what I mean? Like how many boats? I mean, I mean, you know, it. like how pressured does it get? It is extremely pressured. Um, usually June 18th is when you're allowed to keep bass in Maryland. So that's when this tournament start on there. It's nothing to have two or three club tournaments in there plus local pressure. And then there's always what I call the local poke or the Wednesday nighters or whatever, you'll have 10 to 15 boats and them. So it's even through the week. It doesn't get a break. They start at night tournaments and stuff on there. Um, the, the pressure's insane on that lake. Um, like we were talking, you see a lot of Pennsylvania tags on boats, a lot out of Virginia. So it, it isn't just the local guys, but um, I know there's four or five different clubs that have tournaments in there. And then you'll have the Federation. A lot of times they'll have tournaments on there. And, and Jason, what kind of like, get, give the fans a little bit about, about you and I'll set the stage. So um, if you go back a couple of weeks, guys, you go back in the archives, I was blessed enough to have um, 
Matt Sell of the Maryland DNR on the show. I also had the opportunity to actually go out and fish with him too. And it was my first time actually seeing Deep Creek Lake fishing for pike, which was really fun. That was a blast to see that place. And it was like, it was, it was like Post Guard Hallmark. The leaves were at the perfect color. You're out there. There's very few people. It was a blast. Okay. And then I believe you, I if I now again, correct me if I'm wrong, you commented like I'd like to get on this show. And I was like, yep, sure. Let's get, yep. get you on here. Um, and then that's kind of where we are today. So yeah, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your your history. Like what got you into fishing? I, growing up, was blessed. We moved a lot, but it never seemed like wherever I moved, like you're calling some of these guys the river rats and all that. I ended up at one point in my life lived in Fort Ashby, West Virginia, which is right on the South Branch of the Potomac, which turned me into a river rat. So I got a taste of that. But everywhere we lived, I just was blessed to have somewhere to fish and growing up in Garrett County in Western Maryland that you have three or four lakes around there that like you were saying, you're driving a couple hours to a lake. I got four lakes I could be on within 40 minutes of my house. Wow. So like we got Mount Storm, which is a power plant reservoir. Hmm. The water is very, it's in West Virginia, but it's um, yeah. not very, I can see the smokestacks from my house. That's how close I am to Mount Storm, Mount Storm Lake. So, um, so you can get on that. It gets, pressured a lot early in the year because deep creek will be covered in ice and you can get on mount storm so guys that are blessed that don't have to uh winterize their boats mount storm the joke there and we call it the dead sea um it's very crystal clear i don't know what the ecosystem is in there you'll see very very little aquatic vegetation in there i've had some good days on mount storm where i've caught 30 to 40 bass, but I don't know that in all honesty, I've ever caught one over three pounds out of there. That's really cool though. Cause I seriously, guys, like I've said so many times on this show, I learned something new every day. I didn't know West Virginia nuclear powered Lake. Yeah. Um, and then you guys like, so I'm sharing the screen right now. You'll be able to see this in post-production, but, um, yeah. how big is this thing? Spitball? Is it, it's smaller uh, than deep Creek, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. like brr, third the size of deep Creek. If that a quarter of the size, deep Creek's 3,900 acres. I'm going to say this thing's thousand acres, maybe Whoa. 1,500 acres. It fishes really small too. Okay. Um, on there, and yeah, if you have ten to fifteen boats in that tournament, you're on top of each other. Now, a cool thing they did do up there in the last couple of years, if you go in right about where you're right here, yeah, where your arrow is in there, uh, maybe to your right a little bit up that shoreline up through there, they went in and actually cut a bunch of timber and they tied them with cables that so don't float away or anything like that, and they just cut and dropped them because there was nothing. It That's was, really it, cool. It was very rocky, but other than that, there is no weeds, no lily pads. No, I mean, you got some docks. Mostly would be on your right side, which would be I like a layer of the sucker here. northern side of the lake. You'll have some docks there, but there might be forty to fifty docks, if that, on that lake. Okay. So you split that between a ten boat fleet. So dock patterns out. So most of the time you're you're fishing deep water structure drop shot in there and jigs a lot, it seems like. Now does that there, but you don't tournament fish much, do you? No. Okay. But in most generally, I know a lot of the guys that do, I mean I talk to them daily. It ten pounds will win most tournaments up there. I mean, I've seen a lot of tournaments wow. one with seven and eight pounds. That's what I'm I'm, I'm talking five, one pound fish. So, cause like, I guess yeah. my next question would be with that, that really does teach you how to fish highly pressured, almost West coast Japanese type angler situation. Exactly. Yeah, that'd be a good, and, yeah. And, and does that translate to, and guys, we're really getting into deep Creek here in a minute, but how did this affect your upbringing and your DNA as an angler fishing a lake like this? that's super highly pressured. Does that really part of your DNA now about how you approach lakes? Yeah, I was very blessed like i grew up um if you can find broadford lake on there i grew up my mom and dad was the caretakers there for about five years so we literally i locked and unlocked the gates every day for the park it's maybe 150 200 lake broad B -R -O -A -D, oh, broadford broadford yeah it's a town watershed for mountain lake park now that and still is some really good bass fishing and it had a little bit of everything and this is in um west virginia mountain lake park maryland it's B R. -O -A -D. I can barely see the screen from your guys, so bear with me. It's like a mile away. There we go. Yeah, Broadford Park. Yeah, right there. Broadford Lake. Yep. I'm just let it load up here. Now that that's and and then how big was this? How big is this place here? Uh, a couple hundred acres, if that. It's not. It, it's like you said here. It's trolling motor only, electric only. 
that's where I really cut my teeth. And I run into some old guys like Floyd here. There's two old guys, Albert Hurstman and Frankie Knott. So if any of the locals know them, they were dear souls, good old men. Well, at that lake, you weren't, it like, I think it was seven or eight o'clock. We, we opened the gates in there because it's a public park. Oh, well, okay, by gotcha. seven or eight o'clock, you know, if you're a fisherman, you done missed two hours of fishing. So dad, this is back in the day when you could do stuff like this. Dad would hide a key for them. Well, they would come in there at five o'clock in the morning and let their self in and let their self out after dark. So as a thank you, they would wheel in the driveway or whatever, and they'd open up their big old Plano tackle box like you see Bill Dance have. And they're like, pick you something out of there, you know? And they would take me sometimes and teach me. And uh, yeah, that's Broadford Lake there. And uh, so we ransacked through their tackle box and then I'll always pick out like a jitterbug or something. He's like, I don't know if I can let you have that. Oh, dude, this place is down to We got like, a, wow. like an old man's jelly worm or something, you know, but they yeah. always give us something. But then that turned into they started taking me and teaching me. And that's where I kind of cut my teeth. And then I was probably 11, 12 years old, maybe. It's in fifth or sixth grade, somewhere in there. My uncle lived in North Carolina. And uh, so I got the chance to go down there for like a month for the summer one year. So I had a dirt bike. I ended up selling it. And one of our local retail stores, they had this big Plano tackle box, just clear full of all soft plastics. Like it was like the man's jelly worms mm -hmm. back then. Just the flat tail looked like like the quiver worm for missile now, you know. And uh, but that I got that and I bought my first bait caster, which like a, it was like a twenty dollar plastic Shakespeare. But I thought, you know, I'm going to the classic with this thing. So I go down there. My uncle takes me and we go to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. He picks his buddy up and we go to this small lake but it is just full of standing timber. So all I'd ever seen is Broadford Lake. And then I go to this place, it's just full. It looked like cypress trees and stuff. So I get put in the middle of the boat. They're on the front and the back. And I can't even remember what they were throwing or whatever. But I, but even at then, I was like, that ain't right, you know. So I'm there and I put on a big old purple worm and I start, they're casting way out. I start from here to you. I mean, five feet from the boat. I start pitching because I seen this guy on TV named Guido Hibden pitching these bushes, you know? So I was like, that's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, I proceeded to just put a whooping on these two old guys, you know? <laughs> well, my uncle was up in the boat, cracking up. And he's like, I told you he was good. Well, that day I knew this is what, it's so this crazy. Is what I want to do. And, and, and be good at. We talk about this on the show too. If you're going to get a kid into fishing, you have that moment, whether it's fishing or hunting. And, and, and again, I'll bring back up. Matt talked to me about his hunting stuff with his son and stuff. And like, you have that moment with them where, you know, like they're hooked. Yeah. And, and I remember one of my moments was I read a magazine about throwing a crankbait near docks and I, and I bought one crankbait. I, I, it was like the worst color possible for this clear lake. And I casted it near this dock. And like on the fifth cast, I caught like a, it get eight inch bass. It was a dink. Yeah. But the fact that I read something and then I applied it and it worked yes. and this light bulb in my head went off and I thought this thing was like a hundred pound bass. Yeah. It was so freaking cool to me. And it's so important if you're going to take a kid out guys and just tying this back in, just make sure they have success, you know, hundred yeah. percent, get them out there, get them hooked on the sport. Even if it's bluegill, whatever, just get them out there. And talking what we'll talk today and the numbers of fish I put in, I was just talking to Jeff there. I take people all the time and they'll attest to here. I could not imagine the numbers I could put up by myself every day. It, it just, but when you have a kid or my wife goes with me and stuff, or my daughter that you've seen in here, you have to cater to that. Mm -hmm. I can't take my daughter so much or my wife and go skip docks. They can't do it. And then they're frustrated. They're not catching fish or so. So I have to maybe pull out and go to an open water, like a jerkbait pattern. That we might be catching some pickerel, a couple of walleye, bass here and there, but but you really need to cater to that. But I get so much. That's my joy is just taking and teaching people. I have a guy I work with two years ago, he never fished in his life, and now I, his boat's sitting in my backyard now. I mean, he bought a boat. I mean, he that is, is so freaking. Hooked. He's like, uh, I cannot believe there's something this fun that I've never done in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that. That to me is awesome. You know, let's just let's get into that because like this yeah. this was the this was the coolest thing that 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 you talked to me about online when we were going to do this too. Is it sounds like, and again, if I'm wrong, correct me. You had a a personal goal, which is unique because generally, if you're a fisherman, it's I want to win tournaments, I want to catch a a a world record. Yours was very unique and cool. I want to catch four thousand bass, and, yeah. and was that the, like? 
paint the picture. How did this all start? This was for what you wanted? Ago, and it's from social media and all that. I don't fish tournaments, but everybody in our little area knows everybody on there. So I was catching a lot of bass and I had a few really, really good days. I have, this is probably one thing that started it right there. That jig, I made that jig. That one, well, that exact jig right there, that was number 100. That and you can hold it right up to that black camera right that there. Was Perfect. 100. I ended up getting the 121 and I chickened out and wouldn't throw it no more. <laughs> I was, this, that was crazy. I caught 121 bass. Now, those were some 10 inch bass, and I had up to four or five pounders that day. And that was on Savage Reservoir. And that, what year was this? This would have been, that was 514 19. I got it, the date right there. So two, so two thousand nineteen is when and when this starts happening, and yeah. you said you're about so a year hundred fish. Previous to that and stuff, I've had some really good days like that, and you get called out that you're a fibber, let's mm -hmm. say, or their fish stories and all that. Most of that day I had on GoPro and stuff. Mm. And I had two other guys in another boat with me. My son and the guy that I told you never fished before, they're in another boat on there, and I mean it's witness. So that kind of escalated, and then. I talked to some people and like Ken Penrod and stuff. And I talked to Hank Parker at shows and what kind of started it is, is logging fish. What I was really initially wanting to be able to do is say, Hey, on this day, it was 51 degrees. It was raining. This is what the barometer was. This is what the water temperature was. And this is what I was catching them on. So next year I had a shortcut. I could follow that and see if I could start linking that together. You know, if, if it's 85 degrees and sunny, I need to go here and do this. I said, what I, and see if it was repeatable. Well, then my wife, she bought me this calendar and it started into, hey, I caught 31 this day. I caught eight this day. I caught 62 this day. And then 2019 or then 2020 was the first year I started. I kept count. That's damn. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. But then so then, OK, so COVID hits. Um, luckily you're able to get out in the water was 4,000, like this number that you want, when, when did Four, this all become 4,000 when I had the last two years, I had 1642 and then I had 1,364 and I thought this is the number. I was like, that's a good, if I can put a thousand on the board this year, mm -hmm. which my work schedule was crazy this year and stuff. And we've had a crazy year with our home life. My parents both passed away within what 14 months of each other and stuff so i'm sorry to hear it's that. been, really been a crazy year on there i was like if i can put another thousand up on doing the math i could hit four thousand in three years so that's kind of i mean it wasn't three years ago i'm like i'm gonna catch four thousand in three years that just kind of when i started actually logging them and keeping track and really realizing okay you keep putting pennies in the bank soon you got dollars and that's it, it's it just that blew my cool. mind away when you said you did that because i don't know a lot of people that do that and it's such a cool goal yeah. to have i know yeah. you know everyone that tries to chase the 10 point buck the 10 pound bass they want to win a hundred thousand dollars but no one's like i want to just see how many fish i can catch in a year yeah because that's a gaudy stat like whether you want to do it like per trip or like three fish every day for three years yeah. That's insane. And, and did you want to catch this all in the same lake? Or is it just, did you set your own barriers say, and parameters? I mean, in all honesty, I go to Erie every year. The last couple of years have been terrible. I mean, mm. like I was telling Jeff, it wasn't nothing 10 years ago to go and put three to 400 fish in a boat in three days. But that really hasn't helped that number very much at all. 80% really? of them fish have probably come out of Deep Creek Lake. Wow. Um, to be fair and honest on it. This year, <clears throat> two things that contributed. I haven't been on the water quite as much. I think I've missed maybe two weekends. My wife will attest <laughs> <laughs> this year that I haven't been on the lake at some point. But um, on that, and then I changed last year with putting those numbers up. And you, if you see my Facebook pages, mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, hashtag this is 7:47 for the year or 8:15 for the year. And I would watch my numbers through that too and mm -hmm. keep track. But then I started getting a really cool. Anybody can catch 700 dinks. You know, anybody can catch 510 inch bass or whatever, which I catch some small ones, which everybody does on there. But this year I changed a lot, tried different techniques on that. 
and I've got 22 citations this year, all when, out of Deep Creek. When did you start getting heat for that? For about the, like a dank fest? What is that something like immediately people were rumbling, oh, yeah, or yeah. was it once yeah. you got closer to your number? Yeah, the first year when I hit that 1642 and stuff, it, it just the ridicule, which there will always be what they call haters or whatever. The which, internet is just a bastion of yeah. just intelligent so I've conversation. To take so. that and I take it as a compliment, you know, mm. but. The cool thing is, and that's one reason I'm going to be starting my own channel in the spring. Oh, awesome. Um, it'll be called JB Bassin 301, which 301 is our area code. So it's Western Maryland. Oh, cool. Focus. Okay. Those lakes that we're going to discuss today, mostly on there, but putting it on film and, and having reputable people in the boat, like Ryan Cooper and guys like that, that, that work for the DNR agencies, they've been with me and seen, seen those numbers, you know, and I mean, I have a lot of days, it ain't that, mm -hmm. you know, but have a lot of days, it's two and three and four and five some days, but. But like you said, like, I mean, you made the comment earlier, it's like you're putting pennies in the bank and it all yeah. saves up. And then you yeah. also think about like, um, Blue Ocean Strategies talked about those 10,000 hours, it takes 10,000 hours to become really good at anything. I mean, you put that to bass, you're getting up there to where you're very proficient at putting them in the boat. Yeah. And especially when you start logging and, and keeping yourself accountable for that, it's crazy what, what you can accomplish. Yeah. Um, so I guess, I know these are going to be tons of comments and in the comment section one here. One thing I have also to me is I've been there 30 years in that area and I'm on the same lakes a lot. Now you take me out of there and, and take me to Gunnersville or somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that it, I can repeat that as, you know, well, it's easy, but uh, with your son, and you said you, you, know, you did a couple of tournaments there. Yeah. What was it like going out of state? Like after doing it, or it was in a the culture midst of shock. I really? Mean, yeah. The big thing. I mean, when, when I talked to you earlier, you said, bring some lures with you or whatever. If, if any day of the year you called me and said, let's go to Deep Creek tomorrow, I could throw what I have right here in a box and I would be fine on there. And you got a few, and I won't, we got to go through all. You know what? Yeah, let's just go. This is what everyone wants to hear anyway. So let's yeah, just go right into wanna, it. So, yeah. what are? I mean, you know what? Just take the floor. Go for it. Where do you want to start? You just start early spring. Early uh, spring. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just kind of progress through the year. The big thing with is anywhere you have to follow them fish. They're not going to do. And Deep Creek is its own animal versus all these other lakes. The reason being is Deep Creek has. A bazillion docks i mean you can literally not go around that lake you can stand on one dock and throw a rock and go around all 83 miles of shoreline and not hit the next dock with that rock wow it is one after another after another after another after another the whole entire lake is is like that so and, and then so with these techniques we're going to say primarily just for the viewers at home this is going to be a deep creek lake focus but these some of these techniques guys of course will work yeah, everywhere yes. else because yeah. he's caught yeah. you know four thousand fish with them yes so yeah i mean so we're going to talk what what time early spring we talk in february march march, march? we okay. usually typically weather permitting we start in march like i was saying as soon as the ice is coming off they're still skiing on the ski slopes at the wisp when we're we're out Whew. um we launched this year i mean it was 28 degrees when we launched the boat we had ice in our eyes wow um we went McHenry cove it was 38 degrees one day and we caught 27 largemouth and never moved the boat that's it, insane it was crazy they were they were stacked in there on there starting in the early spring it's it's all to me i i can take two lures i mean right there you take a red square bill crankbait nice and right you can hold there. that up to the camera too yeah. and again power of editing i'll i'll, I'll clean that up in okay, post but you can hold it right up there that's a berkeley fritz side oh, and wow. that's just about all i throw i throw it all the others i've tried like the og slims you want a flat side crankbait and i have not found a better one are they fragile do the bills break yeah I'm not going to lie about it, but I went to a show in Raleigh. This has been before the Fritz side came out and guess who was there? It was David Fritz. So I weasel my way through the crowd. I catch him over to the side and I start talking to him because I'd heard about this thing. Next thing, one thing leads to another and Mr. Fritz is just, and that was my first Fritz side. Well, Whew. the last four years, my largest bass has come on that and it's been out of Deep Creek. This actual one, I got him in here somewhere the same day. Largest bag I ever caught out of Deep Creek in one day was on that lure. I had 27 pounds. Damn. I had a 6.5 and a 6.3 this year, and that's why the line's still on it. I love the teeth marks, too. You know that's a yeah. good one when, when, when it's After got those battle scars. After I caught the 6.3, I cut this off, and I was like, you're done. You're retired. <laughs> this one. And now, is, is that crayfish pattern actually work, uh, that color scheme work well at Deep Creek? Because I wouldn't have thought after yes, being at Deep Creek it would be that way. It'll only work up, I don't want to say, you can catch them all year long on it, but mm -hmm. the, the, the sweet spot of it, 
I've noticed is when that water gets up, and like I said, the ice is just going off. So that water is 34, 36, 38 degrees. We're catching them. Dang. So um, the one the one I caught here on March, what was it, March 24th, like I said, we was in McHenry Cove, and we couldn't even launch the boat because the main lake was still locked up, mm. and the ramp wasn't even open yet. So we were fishing off the bank. That, that is crazy. That was, you want to show uh, that one off to the camera? Yeah, yeah, that was March 24th of this year. That was a five to six pounder there. Didn't have a scale on that one, which everybody. <laughs> and, then, and then for the people the that don't know, these are accolades that are given out yeah. by the state. Yeah, this is a Maryland trophy site. When everybody says I hear, I, I tell guys at work where don't fish, I got a citation. They're like, oh man, I'll be, are you going to court? Or you know, I'm like, no, it's a trophy site. It's a good citation. So, but this is through the Maryland Trophy Fishery Program on there. Hmm. Um, they have a uh, program on there. And actually you can get, I, I didn't bring any with me, but after you catch three different species, you get an angler award. And then after really? you catch five, you get the next level. And if you get 10, you get a master angler award and a $250 Bass Pro gift card. How did you, so, how did, I mean, this is not information go, that's readily available. How yeah, just go on, uh, just put in Maryland Trophy Fish and it'll walk you right through it and you can log your catch it's a catch they used to not do this and she can attest my daughter um 2004 is the best year i've ever had in bass fishing but we'll get to that <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow it used to be not that way so you had to wait till after june 18th when you could actually keep the fish and then you had to take them to a certified place which i don't know if you remember the old johnny's bait house which turned into bill's mm. outdoor center it's right there on Deep Creek. Um, it was a bait and tackle shop. That was our, our only local place you could turn them in pretty hmm. much. There was a hardware store that used to do it too down there on the north end of the lake. But you actually had to take the actual fish in and have it weighed and certified and witnessed, which killed the fish. So as we've talked about progressing through as an angler, when you start out catching bluegills to, okay, these bass are old and fragile mm -hmm. and I didn't want to kill them. So I wouldn't take and turn them in because you pretty much had to kill them to, to turn them in. Well, in the last few years, I guess the states realized that and they come out with this catch photo release program where you have to have witnessed and you measure them and it's by length on there and then they'll send you a citation. And then you Why is your... that? Like, it's so weird in 2022 because even I believe, guys, and then you're going to fact check me in the comment section, the, the big smallmouth caught at Lake Erie, I think it was also KIA. I don't think it made yeah. it. Yeah. How is this still a thing where, like, so Texas, a great example is Texas. They where estimated that fish at what, 30 years old? It was insane. It was like yeah. a dinosaur. It was a living yeah. dinosaur. Yeah. But at, yeah, uh, and they took that. What was my know. thought? Oh, yeah, Texas they are very very passionate about keeping those big fish alive yeah. and they're basically saying like if you bring it to us alive we will make yeah. a replica and yes. we'll either bring it yeah. into yeah, the if texas you watch anything of josh jones i mean that's yep. what he does and he's all hammering oklahoma for not following them. so so with the catch uh the catch release program is this so like you stick you stick um let's say you stick a seven pound uh, a ten pound largemouth out of uh deep creek tomorrow are you calling matt up who are you calling how does that whole process work for for people at home what do you mean like a 10 pounder you catch a 10 pound largemouth out of deep creek well that wouldn't classify as a state record okay let's there. go 12 pounds then okay yeah 11 8. actually you have to have about two ounces so you need 11 9 now okay 11 9. <laughs> yeah, so I this <laughs> if it ever happens i got my yeah. facts um on there um i have like ken pavel's number he's with fisheries and stuff so on there what you're to do technically let's say you catch it in the night tournament what do you do at two o'clock in the morning? You got a 12 pound largemouth, you think, in your boat. On there, you're to call the Maryland DNR agency, just like you would if there was something going on, the 911 number, basically, for DNR hmm. on there. And they're to patch you through. They're supposed to be somebody 24 7 on call with fisheries, is the way I've, mm. I've understood it. Because I always thought, I mean, I was close with that plague. I was close. I mean, I thought that was, I thought I had, had yeah. it. you know, I and broke it for the length, but not the weight. And we'll definitely get into that too today. But, but um, uh, so anyway, that continue. would be your process if you had a record fish on there. Call them up. You go to the boat ramp. They yes. show up. Now, you said nowadays they're not going to want you to kill it. They're going to yes. want you to do a, a catchway release thing. Yeah. Are they bringing a scale there? Yeah, to they'll you? bring a certified scale as from what I understand. Gotcha. What would I do? More than likely the fish is going to end up in that time frame. I mean, if it's Tuesday at one o'clock, yeah, there's probably somebody available. But if it's Saturday at eight o'clock in the evening, I'm probably not going to have it. I would take it and I would probably go to Airhead Market because they have a certified scale and see if they would weigh it. And mm -hmm. I have witnesses and I'd make sure it was on film. I mean, if this was ever to happen to me. 
because they're going to want a, the notoriety of that and the record, you know, I would think on there. And, and that's such a hard dilemma because I've thought about if I ever caught a record, the idea of killing it, that, that's such yeah. a weird thing. Because again, you saw that dinosaur smallmouth and the idea like that thing's 30 years old. Like that's yeah. so weird to see that thing belly up yeah. um, just for the notoriety. The largest smallmouth I ever caught was 6'4 and it was out of Erie. And, and I put her in a live well and I rode around with her for an hour and I started feeling guilty. I was like, I can get a replica. Mm -hmm. you know and i ended up taking her back and i mean i caught her off her bed they're all caught off beds up there and put her back but just like that it just once you get to that point you don't i mean i caught four thousand bass and I didn't as far as i know kill any of them that's impressive i mean that's a testament that that, that I mean, really I'm sure is impressive some of them made a couple here and there but i mean i didn't none of them went in the frying pan you know on there how many accolades do you have is it is this like a, a tip of the iceberg this it started out as a joke last year because we caught some nice ones and then that's when i was like a couple friends caught them and stuff i have this boy fish stick i fish with we call him <laughs> but he caught a nice one i was like you can get a citation for that you know it's pretty cool it's just a paper cit trophy citation and all this and that started in to it and he's like man next year being this year he's like we ought to see how many we can get i said i'm gonna wallpaper my room with them that's freaking and, and cool so, that's cool yeah, actually I have, I have 22 of them right now so I started out, my wife's here, but like she started buying me like the really nice $10 frames and it got to the point I'm getting the $2 ones from Walmart now. <laughs> so, so I'm assuming yeah. you have a room for this. Is not in her yeah. poor kitchen that no, you're doing no, this? Okay. No, all there's fish and stuff all over the house. <laughs> but yeah. So how does it, like, do you have this like memorized or is it on your phone to where you know, like the pike example, is that something where you're measuring, calling, Googling, or do you have all this memorized? Uh, most of them I have, as far as what qualifies, yes, I have sir. them all on my phone. So if okay. I catch an odd species, I caught a 16 inch, 16 and three quarter inch crappie on jerk bait this year. I never catch crappie out, really? of, out of deep Creek. One here, one there. Well, this thing was a frying pan. I was like, holy moly. It was 16 and three quarter. Now that one I had to look, I was like, I'm sure it's citation, but I couldn't remember. It's like 15 inches for that. But like large mouth, small mouth pike. The ones I catch a lot of, I, I have memorized. Large mouth. What's the citation? 21 inches. 21 inches? Yeah, it's 20 for small mouth and 38 for pike. Good Lord. I'm not yeah. good at math. I wouldn't memorize yeah. any of those numbers. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the pike pick, one. Pickerel's 25. Pickerel. Uh, We're going to talk. 27. I want to talk to you about the pickerel because I want to I ask you. Well, I, let's just do this right now before we get back into the bass stuff, guys. Pickerel, pike, pike. Uh, one of the best episodes we've had. I think we have close to like 3,000 downloads on the Pike episode. People are shocked that Pike exists in Deep Creek. Uh, when I was in the boat with Matt, and he was saying like, I don't know if this body of water can have a 50 incher, and I'm like, Matt's wrong. You're I mean, as I say, like, I you, maybe not not all of them, but I think you got a chance of a 50 incher coming they're, out of here. They're in there. I I would I would not bet against that. I'll put it that way. And then this one here, that's the biggest one I ever got in the boat. It's 47, 20, 47 and a quarter. How'd that yes. happen? That I caught bass fishing and I caught it on that actual, that's the actual lure I caught it on. What I is caught, that? That is a, uh, you asked me too fast. That's a Berkeley. We got all um, the time in the world. We got 10 hours. <laughs> that is, um, oh shoot. You asked me way too fast. I know all my lures and I don't remember that one, but anyhow, it's a Berkeley jerk bait. Bone, bonish color. With yeah. Blue back. It's yeah. called pearl oyster. Okay. On there. Deep Creek, I like the plus one, what they call plus one, which you can see exactly identical jerk baits. I don't near new near as good, and they say a jerk bait bite the fish are fishing up, feeding up, but I like the bigger bills on there, and I'll throw that even in six foot of water. I'll keep the rod up. Okay, I do I do better on them. Um, but yeah, that. What time of year was it? Like paint the scene here. Were, were you in a tournament? Were you uh, by yourself? That was May twenty seventh. It was the day I caught it on. No, it was by myself um if you want to click on deep creek i can show you even where i caught her at all right let's go uh, go down to the south um right there where your little square is if you want to put your that is the boat uh, okay That's so we got the, the bottleneck boat. here so that yeah. is right there right above uh, okay so we got the bottleneck the here okay. yeah there. right there right above your cursor that is the public boat ramp oh wow there so that's the really boat ramp there, on the creek lake that so has public down access oh wow so if you go and south of there so right in this pocket right here no way down okay okay, okay gotcha right in this pocket right here no way down okay. clear the end of the lake uh, okay gotcha yeah. it's an area we call turkey neck and right go down with your cursor i'm dyslexic there we go we'll find it to your right to your right up a little bit 
this generic area. area. To your left and down, that little point that's coming. So this generic right area. Right off that no, to your left a little bit. Down. Did you know right immediately? Right off that yeah, point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Did you know I, immediately? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, when I work a jerk bait, I work it very, very hard, very aggressively. And I mean, I'm doing the jerk. I'm ripping it. Jerk, jerk, jerk. And it was like, oh. I was like, that's, that's crazy. And usually you have that oh, moment and it's gone. Because mm -hmm. they, I mean, if, if you see that fish's mouth, it's crazy. But the thing lodged in sideways in its mouth. Seriously. And you know how like their lip comes back and they have like little flapper, like yeah, yeah, yeah. their lip. Well, the line got up under there. So when I first got her How up. How did you not break off? Oh I my. fought that fish for about 30 minutes. No, no joke. I had 12 pound pea line fork <sighs> is what I caught it on with no, no leader. <laughs> And, uh, did you have a net? Did you have a pike size no, net? No. <laughs> um, that's a story for another time. <laughs> <laughs> so if my cousin Brian's watching, yeah, I'm still mad. At we just got back from Lake Erie. Well, you, you, yeah, you well, can't hit it brought, that. You got to tell the story now. We had so much stuff when we went to Lake Erie, which was like the week before this. I have this big, whole, what, a holy crap net, you know? Don't lose your jerk bait <laughs> net, you know? Because you'll catch even a 22-inch pickerel and they'll shear you off. And that jerk bait's gone. And so we take the big net out of the boat. Well, I get back and I hop in the boat for daylight, go fishing and forgot and then put the big net back in. So I got this little rinky dink net, you know? So, but yeah, it was a battle. I get this thing up and get it in the boat. So I did end up, that's the first fish in probably eight or 10 years I kept because I was pretty certain she may break the record on there. And I wanted to get her on, excuse me, two different scales on there so i had and she was 18 pound 10 ounces is what she was it, when it's your moment it's your moment <laughs> when she first come up i caught one a year prior to this i caught it on a little white spinner bait 10 pound braided line but she was 16 pound 10 ounces and she was 46 inches long on there and i knew this fish was bigger and 22 pounds is a state record mm. on there and i was like this fish has a shot I mean, it, this is the biggest one I've ever got up to the boat. Now, do you it's, purposely ever, like, specifically go for pike, or are you just bass, no, and then sometimes no. you catch pike? I went with Ryan. We and Ryan Cooper go a lot, and hopefully he can be on the show. That's the guy. That's the pike guru on Deep Creek. He targets them. He and I went. I bass fished. Brian throwed his big, um, they call him, what, a hot tail glider and stuff on there, like a big glide bait and stuff, and he targeted them that day and stuff but personally myself i never never really target them i'm straight bass and that's how i end up catching like the crappie the the walleye and that's insane that's yeah. absolutely insane so like out, out of all the accolades that you have there which one is like near and dear to your heart is it the pike the pike or this one <laughs> that's old school going back to, i told you the best year i ever had was 2004 it was black and white back then Ah, this, get... yeah this was in the newspaper so it was okay away. gotcha yeah this is way before the cell phones and all that so which i can show you that i put her that's my daughter there with it i put her in a newspaper but that one was nine two that's the biggest one i ever officially weighed in in maryland that was deep creek too or that, no, else? that was out of out of broadford oh, okay gotcha gotcha yeah. gotcha yeah um but i caught several big ones that year and i really thought i would break 10 and when i caught that one I mean, you have to understand that was before cell phones and all so that. Close. And I was huh. like, that that's that's a big one. That's a massive and Maryland So we bass. took it down the bills and weighed it. and But that's, again, going back to, like, how people were the haters of, you didn't, you know, how many fish you got or whatever. Well, that was, I don't know what it was that year, but, I mean, I was catching some, some hogs. I don't understand and, the hate that you're getting for that because, again, it, it's – I, I'll take it back, guys, for you guys that actually watch like a lot of the Major League Fishing. Justin Lucas had this one day. I think he was up on like Winnipeg. It was either Lake Superior, Lake Huron. Anyway, they're fishing a tournament. And I think he said they caught he caught like 500 fish, smallmouth, in one day. Yeah. And it was almost like one every two minutes or something yeah. it broke down to. And people were complaining because they're all only three pounds. And it's like, but to process that you're still catching two fish every yeah. other minute is insane. You catching three fish every, like that's still, a, yeah. that's a mind boggling achievement to do. When my son fished the high school tournaments, we had paper tournaments, which was on the MLF format, which was the greatest thing that ever happened to us. Cause on Deep Creek, <laughs> we were really, mm -hmm. um, they set the single day record for MLF for high school in the state of Maryland. How, how does yeah. that work for, for high school? 
it's the exact same thing. You can download the format. We had we ordered the actual scales, our club did, the same ones that MLF uses. And as boat captain, the same as the captains, the judges, refs, whatever you want to call them in the boats with MLF, that was my job. Okay. Every fish that was caught, I had to weigh and record it wow on there and then i downloaded it to the app which was cool because my wife and them could be at home and watch and be like you know this team has 20 pounds and we got they got 26 and this one has like you could watch it live mm -hmm. on your phone the, the score tracker up that's so same, freaking cool it was the exact same thing and it was a great thing mlf did and, and give that to the high schools to you that format because it was through mlf i i again I mean, not to light, like light this fire again. We'll do this on a separate show, guys. But I do enjoy being able to watch it in real time, yes. seeing that competitiveness. Because, again, when you're going with a five-fish tournament, the pros and cons, one of the negatives, I think, is once you hit a certain amount of weight, it's pretty much over. You hit... Yes. If you somehow crack out 30 pounds for five, yes. you're not losing. Yeah. With this format... And that may be there are only five. Yeah, exactly. You know, where, you know... Jacob Willer is going to whop you. He's going to come in with 60 pounds and they might all be two pounders, but, but that's the funny thing is the people are complaining are not the ones that. winning. If you want to fish five fish, there is tournaments all day mm -hmm. long everywhere. I love the MLF. I love that. Catch them, release them. I love that. And then it, it changed it. You didn't see Kevin Van Dam winning them. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody knew Jacob Willer in them and, and till that, that came on. And it's just you know. different. I, I fish five fish. I fish. I would fish major league fishing style. It just gives you a different flavor. You yeah. don't have to always go and eat it's cheeseburger. It's a totally you know? different technique on there. And she can attest. We fished some tournaments, and it was supposed to be MLF. And we get to the dock, and I roll in with my boys. And next thing you see, a little chit chatting going over. And next thing we're changing. We're going five biggest. So and I've seen that at the dock too. What is it like competing so, with either your daughter or your or your son in I the can't boat? I compete with my daughter. I was gonna She'll say, are, are you full heavy week, metal, but... like intense, or are you chill in the boat? No, no. When I have them in the boat, it's it's different. I love going with my daughter. It, it's funny. She was sitting in the back of the boat. We caught crisscross applesauce. She, I take the seat out. She sits on her butt eating a bag of chips, and she'll skip. We call it a sissy jig, a Ned rig up under and box Sissy chick. yeah there's an old man this was for ned rig ever anybody ever heard of it and this goes back to like you're saying i can't believe what the kids have today with the internet oh if i'd have had this when i was a kid mm -hmm. the the access to shows like this and randy block it and stuff like that i mean i literally went to the grocery store and my mom was grocery shopping i was sitting there flipping through reading the bass masters you know and that's that's all we had and then you had saturday morning with bill dance or whatever but mm -hmm. But on that, it, it's hard. You, you have to change. And then, like we were saying, and when I take my wife or my daughter or some kids and stuff, you have to, you have to dance to that music, and you can't go like you would. So It's hard. Yeah. It's really hard, especially when you're like, I, I guess, you know, when I started competing with my wife, we would do like one or two tournaments. It, it, it's more for the experience. It's not trying to be as intense. And again, usually those tournaments are also not for like the same amount of money. I'm not fishing for a hundred thousand dollars either. So like that's, it, it's yeah. more of just for the experience. It's almost like rec league softball or something. I can't believe some of the guys that pull in with $85,000 boats and a hundred thousand dollar truck and they went to win $400. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't make a lot <laughs> and, of, uh, and we've got some guys sense. up home that are sticks and, and there's a couple that I think they should, I think they'd do great at the next levels. And then, stuff i mean it's it's not there's no money there i mean i'm sorry it's not a sport when yeah. if you're a major league baseball if you're playing for virginia tech or, or you know maryland university you don't have to pay the mlb a hundred thousand dollars a year to be a part of the organization yeah and, and in this sport the way it is set up right now it is you need pockets yeah yeah i can't justify fishing and i have to win to hopefully break even mm -hmm. with what i have in a tournament it's miserable. It'd be yeah. too stressful. I spend way too much now on fish and stuff, and I'm always in Dutch. But <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a gateway drug. It really is. Yeah, and yeah. So you were talking about the sissy jig. What? Yeah. Sissy out jig. of all these baits, and yeah, let's we'll get right back into it. So you got the uh, you got the Fritz side for like early early spring March time. Yeah. As absolutely. you move into the April May area, what what do you adjust to? When that water temperature, we're going to start out with a Fritz side, and then this and jerk baits. As soon as the ice goes off, these two right here. I'm going to be throwing one of those two. Mega Bass makes, this is both Mega Bass blanks. These are made by Nick Folks from Folks Custom Cranks. If anybody's looking for some really good jerk baits, look at him. It's F L U K S, Folks Custom Cranks. He custom painted these for me. Um, 
those are my two favorite. Surprisingly, this trout, we call it Mr. Trout, that trout pattern has produced greatly for us. Um, I throw this a lot on a more dollar day. If it, we were fishing like today where it's rainy, drizzly, overcast, that's my go-to. The sun's out right there. It's called the Smalley Special on there. And, and then you're throwing these jerk baits more going into the the late spring summertime, which is interesting. I'm cause... throwing them up till the water is about in the mid 50s on there. But like I said at Deep Creek, you have to understand that as soon as that ice is off, and usually the first second week of April, dock docks start coming in. If there's a dock in that lake, you can catch fish on it. You can go up there today, and I guarantee you, I can catch fish on the docks. Mm. I mean, there's still some docks in on there. It, it's a fish magnet. So oh, it, it, it's docks. It's now the one thing I saw. There's a, an abundance of aquatic vegetation. Yes. Um, does docks, that play at all? Yes. Docks and punching. Now that's like I said before. I found something that I'm really good at, and it produces consistently over and over. This year I did a good bit of punching. Um, Timmy Reams. I talked to him. He fishes the National Professional Fishing League. On there, he was in the hunt for Angler of the Year this year. Um, I talked to him. He helped me a lot, taught me some stuff on that. And the biggest thing talking to him, it put me some confidence in it because punching's crazy. That lake is, is swarmed with aquatic vegetation. I mean, it's bad as far as uh, it, it's everywhere. And mm -hmm. that's the problem with it is finding the fish in it because it is everywhere. And you can go, I went and I was like, Timmy told me, he's like, you need to just take your punching rod and nothing else. So I did that one day and I was all day and I caught four in a circle about big as this table, bam, bam, bam. And that was it. I caught four fish and I, I run everywhere I thought would be good. And I can't do that when I know that same day I could have went on docks and caught 20 to 30. Gra grass is a different beast because it's almost like you have this massive like football field size lawn and there's going to be one area that's the juice and yeah. it's not visual. It, and yeah. it's such a mental fortitude of just flipping. Yeah. And I remember when my brother and I, we fished a college tournament at Lake Champlain and then you have what it looks like is like 10,000 acres of grass and you're just doing this yeah. and you're listening to, to a podcast or music and you're just waiting to find yeah. that one area. And that being said, with Deep Creek Tooth thing, it frustrated me this year. I go in there. I could show you it's up in Beckman's Peninsula. I go up in there, and I'm punching it, and that's where I caught them. I was like, okay, I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to get – okay, I knew there was fish there, and they say they'll stay there. There's something there holding them fish in that area. I knew exactly where it was. I dropped the waypoint. I thought, I'll get back in there the next week. I go in there, and that grass is dead brown. So I don't know if they had sprayed it. Hmm. When was this? Time time of year. This bro, it was hot. It was summertime. July, August, somewhere in there. It would have been after July in there because usually it's more towards the end of summer when that grass is up and it tops out good and stuff. But do you know where the island is? Does it, did he tell you where the island Beckman's nope. Island? Nope, I've been there one time in my life. Yeah, so but there's that's why what we got they the Google call Earth. The, the island. If you want to go, uh, da, da, go down where it says Patterson's Marina. It just said there, right there, uh, right to here. your right, to your right, to your right. Zoom out a little bit. Go back that little channel there. Right here. Yeah. Zoom out a little bit. That's not it. That's State Park. Right there where the buoys are. That's uh, marking these? the island. Yep. That's the danger buoys for the island. Right there between those four buoys. And those four buoys are physically there. Okay. There's a rock island. So you can see how that point comes out and cuts down into about 10 foot. Mm. They're right in there. Yep. So off of that island is where I was. Wow. And like I said, I went in there one week, it's big, green, milkful, hydrilla, and the next week it's just dead brown, I, just the whole cove. So it's probably the spraying. I mean, I know, I, I know there's I, a lot of mallet. You can see all the docks. Yeah. And that ain't half of them. There's a lot of, there's a lot of money on that whole lake. It, so I'm sure yeah. if you own a multi million dollar home and you're complaining because you can't water ski and you're, Two hundred thousand dollar boat. It, it, that's it's something that's done. Yeah, and, it's so hard. I mean, guys, you know, on this show we talk about the conservation. Where you know, it's called subaquatic vegetation. It's not a weed. It, it's actually needed for like the ecosystem to be healthy. Yes. And you look at Florida, where they had this red tide, and one of the reasons that they had such a massive manatee kill is they over pesticide the rivers and the lakes. And what happens? It flows through the ocean and it kills everything. And you know, these lakes, guys, are not public swimming pools. They're not your private, you know, place that, you know, it's supposed yeah. to be gin clear with nothing in it. It's a, a living, breathing thing. And so we do need to find the proper balance between the million dollar mansions and the wake boats yeah. and keeping the lake in good, healthy condition. Yeah. And it's definitely, I'm catered to, <laughs> to, to that end. You know, I'm there with my bass boat with duct tape on the seats. They're, they could care less about me. 
and and that's something too about like and i, I we'll, we'll get back to we'll, we'll, we'll table that for a little bit later on but so jerk baits you got jerk baits now until the water gets jerk to about 60 crank baits until the water up in them 50s and then the docks are in and then to me it's all about the docks it, it and it's not so much a what is a where i i if you get a bait up under them docks more than likely i mean your chances is through the roof of getting bit the thing with it is like i took that fellow with me had never fished before we're trying to fish and he's hitting two three feet just beside the docks he, he didn't know how to skip he's learning learning how to cast from square one just like taking a kid and i'm skipping a dock and i'm skipping a jig um big secret to skipping docks i started making my own jigs and i went to an arky style head on there i like a compact jig and i like the least amount i can get away with as far as a weed guard well wait there. the reason i went to this arky head is it'll skip better for mm -hmm. me anyhow i like it and what size weight do you prefer for, for a jig? Three like eighths, quarter to three eighths. This is my favorite jig because Deep Creek is loaded with smallmouth. That's small, that's quarter ounce on there. And 99% of the time, I got a TRD on the back, which that one's dried up. That's that one I told you a couple years ago. I caught a couple hundred on. That's so freaking cool. But like that, this is one I, I literally cut these lures off my rod the other day when, when we were talking. I took off what I actually had on. That was what the last jig I was fishing this year. And that's just a TRD, a Z Man hula stick, hula. I trim it down a little bit. These are jigs that I make. Um, that was funny, like you're talking about these guys that are river rats. You can see my jig has a longer shank on it, and it's a heavy wire hook mm. on there. You'll not find a mold to fit that. I had to custom my mold. I had really? to grind it out. Um, and that started, we've lost a couple nice fish, and we went to Kentucky Lake, and my boy lost an absolute giant, straightened it up under a oh. on there and i had lost a couple and i was like no more of this it was nice if you got snaggy you could straighten it out but but i went to the heavier hook and then we never never lost what made more. you decide to go with with a, a stick bait as your trailer because generally with jigs it's always some kind of crawl imitation this started out with the sissy jig on there aka guys the ned rig yeah aka the ned rig okay so we're throwing a ned rig as everybody does now we're throwing it on a fine wire hook this just want to make the Ned mold. This is Randy Howe's Midwest finesse hmm. head mold. And we go through so many, I, it's a good investment to make your own. And I'll hopefully be doing some videos on that. Oh, some cool. tips and tricks and how to save some money on that. But uh, so we went to a pond one day and there was snow on the ground still. The ice had just come off this little local pond. My son was still pretty little. And there was a guy down in Frostburg, Maryland, Ron Weimer. He made baits and he painted. That's where Mr. Trout come from originally. That was his pattern and he doesn't make baits anymore. So Nick, with Ron's permission, copied it. But anyhow, he made skirted Ned rigs, jigs. So, But what it was, was basically this jig didn't have the keeper on it. He put a rubber band, the rubber skirt band on there and a little skirt. It was a skirted Ned rig. So my son had picked a couple of those up. So we go to this little pond and being super cold water and all this, I thought, man, I'm going to a jerk bait, super slow. I mean, the water's in the thirties, mm -hmm. you know, he puts the skirted Ned rig on and starts catching bass and the light bulb come on. I was like, that's not right, but it is. That's mm -hmm. crazy. So that started it. So we were buying them off of him and they, they were pricey. So that started in, but with, that small shank hook and you had that band on there you'd catch two or three and your your skirt was just ripped out because it was the hook diameter wasn't big enough for that band to squeeze it tight enough to hold it one so that turned into like all mine that i make i mean you can see on there that's one that's yellow i hand tie all my skirts i hate that when you're fishing and your skirt's falling out i hate it so that started into me making my own on there and then I lucked out. I have a friend that gives me lead for free. He gets it at his work. So Lucky. lead doesn't catch, cost me nothing. So yeah, that saved me a bunch. So I was like, I invest in some molds and I'm set. So what's your favorite color scheme for Deep Creek? Color screen, green pumpkin, probably that one there with, that's like a root beer. It's like an orange, just brown. Oh. If you can see that. In a green so pumpkin it's head. almost like a perch. Cause that was the one thing too, that I saw there when we were fishing like these big perch imitators. And I, I think there's guys, there's a picture up on my YouTube page. I caught a, almost a five pound bass throwing a musky tube and just flipping around grass yeah. lines. But it was like, it was a perch imitator. Everything was yeah. perch. Um, do you, do the fish really key on a specific forage? Is it perch? Is it crayfish? Creek, perch is, is good. My wife, the biggest one she caught this year was on a perch pattern jerk bait. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, 
Um, yeah, perch is a big forage on there, but there's a lot of just bait fish in general. Um, that's where talking to David Fritz, as soon as they quit biting this, when that water hits 52, 53, 54 degrees, that red will, will, will die out on there. You can't beat it early in the year on there. And then as soon, and he, he told me, he said, you're going to be fishing it and the, the bites are going to die off. Mm. He said, as soon as it does throw that one in the box and this one's honey shad. He said, go to that the rest of the year. So that's typically what I do. But at that point on deep Creek, the docks are in. So my crank crankbaits take a back seat to jigs and skipping docks. And so what, what is your crankbait setup? Are, are you fishing this on fluorocarbon monofilament? Like I what was your whole setup? 12, 12 pound P-line floor clear. Okay. 90% of my rods, that's what I fish on. Um, I keep things very, very simple. I have usually one jig rod, um, heavy, like a heavy action jig rod that I'll throw a big one on. Like I call it a jig and pig or whatever, but I'll throw like the zoom super chunk or whatever. Let's say I'm going down and there's a tree in the water somewhere. I want to pitch or flip to, and I'll have, I go up to 15 cigar and Vizx on that. But Seaguar and Vezex is terribly expensive. That's why I use P-Line Floor Clear. It's, so if anybody's out there is looking for a good line, try it. Line, you can get on yeah. Amazon and you can buy a big spool, like the 3,000 yard for like 37 bucks. That is a good tip. Always buy the bigger spool because yeah. you're going to need it, especially with like discounts, guys, whether it's a local tackle shop or tackle warehouse, wherever. You know, buy your line in bulk when it's on yes. sale because it's going to really tide you over. I am a fanatic for changing line. I get, she will attest, I go through a lot. Mm-hmm. Pretty yeah, much every too. week we're sitting in the living room chit chatting and she's holding a spool on a stick while I'm filling reels up. <laughs> she is a saint because yeah, I don't know if is. my wife would deal with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I see you got some frogs there too. How does that yeah, work in your repertoire? Yeah, frogs this year, I have never been a frog per se fisherman till this last couple years. And I took that boy fish stick with me one day and he had eight or ten really good blow ups. And once again, I if I see I don't I'm not too proud to say I should have thought of that, you know, on there. So I started when he wasn't with me without him knowing, seeing what I could do with him. Mm-hmm. And we did really good this year on frog bites. That being said, I hate them. It's the Why? most inefficient lure I've ever seen in my life. One day I had eight good blow ups. I put one of those fish in the boat. Mm. Now, everybody, I've pulled them. I've bent the hooks out. I've tried everything. I miss a tremendous amount of fish. I like you said well, efficiency. Want, yeah, that's so interesting to me. That's a keyword that you say said. I say a tremendous amount, but if I have 10 bites, I'm lucky to put three in a boat. Yeah. I, and I, that just I, frustrates me because they're quality bites. That is interesting because the with with your whole, with your DNA of, of doing this 4,000 fish in, in three years, everything is about efficiency. It's yes. about trying to get everything into the boat. Yes. If um, you ever fish with me, you'll see. And one thing that kills me watching tournaments is guys will be in on docks. They'll flip in and catch a fish. And it'll rip their sink. Let's say they're fishing a sinker, rip the sinko off. Well, the cameraman's on them. They set down the boat. They open up the hatch. They're getting their boxes out. There is no way. If you fish with me when I'm fishing, those are in my pocket right there. Usually mm-hmm. I have a hoodie on or they're right there. I'm, I'm all about, if I take you fishing and you make a thousand casts, I'll make 3,000. And that's, that's my goal. That's impressive. I mean, whatever the number is B, it is about the efficiency of it. And I've noticed it with guys I've fished with, and I've noticed it with the guys that I've watched that are really good. There's a couple boys on our lake, and you're, it's it's impossible to be their twin brothers. Everybody knows them. I'm not going to mention names, but they are the best around. And they're hard. To, that's who you're going to try to beat when you go to Deep Creek. So, so and, then what is a strategy if you're fishing for our tournament anglers out there? Let's say, um, I mean, let's go like with, with right now, with the late fall bite. Let's go with that. Like, what, is it all still docks? Are you still fishing just a jig and you're just covering as much water as possible? Yes. Yep. Um, I was fishing two weeks ago when we first talked. The next day I went and I caught him on docks. Wow. On there. And until the docks are out, I'm on docks. There's fish offshore, but that's just not my forte. And you're never going to really go to Deep Creek and see many guys offshore throwing like a 10XD or a deep diving crankbait or whatever because they better if they're in a tournament they better know what they're doing and be on them because if not guys on docks will will beat you or in the grass is it is it an area lake or a pattern lake and what i guess what i mean by pattern pattern um to say area you can pretty much cut that lake in half and it wouldn't bother anybody that ramp that i showed you on there if you go down there and watch it it blast off if there's 30 boats in that tournament 
28 of them is going south and they're going to be there all what I call the southern end of the lake, which would be south of that boat ramp. Um, pretty much where that bottleneck is right there, right there. Right there. Yeah. Yes, 99% of your tournaments are run from where your ex was there south. That's crazy. Wow. Yes. Um, there is there fish in the north end? Yeah. And you'll see guys up there. But I don't know how many tournaments I'll watch, blast off or whatever, because I'll yield to them guys a lot. And I talk to them guys, and I'm like, yeah, they got there's tournaments on Deep Creek every weekend. How's the so, pressure on there when it comes to, if you're fishing a tournament, do, does everyone feel spaced out or are they on top of each other? They're spaced out. It's a pretty big lake. And then on that, like I said, there's thousands of docks in there. And most of them, that's what they're fishing, docks or grass, and it's everywhere. So, I mean, there's some key areas like Turkey Neck, Green Glade, Hoop Hole. Those are the hot, that's that's the major hot spots that, like I said, if there's 30 boats in that tournament, 25 of them are going to end up in one of them three places probably. Wow. So how they handle that, I know when we fish in high school tournaments, or the problem I have a lot, I talk to these guys a lot, and they're like, I, I'll stay out of the south, you know, or if I pull into a cove and I see them and, okay, they're fishing, I know they probably just started there, you know, I'll yield, I, I yield to them. And I think that's the respectful thing to do. And, the, and they're, the guys up there are really, it's a cool group. It's about like when I walked in here, I was here five minutes and I got friends, you know, and mm-hmm. you go to that boat ramp and, and yeah, they, they have their secrets and what they, they're not going to show you what they're using or exactly how they caught them. But for the most part, they're, they're pretty good guys. So with that said, and you having a tight knit community on that, in that small lake, is there anything that you tweak to be able to catch these four, th- like the 4,000 fish or to do all in a tournament, or do you just yeah. stick with the jig and, and then you don't have to give away all the secrets or anything. But so I also see you have some top waters on there. You have a spinner bait. Is, is this something yeah. that's more spinner, of a situational spinner bait? I mean, this would be jumping to the fall this time of year. As soon as them docks are out, I catch a lot of smallmouth, and that's one of my favorites right there. It's just a little single willow leaf. I got the number four willow leaf on there. Um, and I like a Kitek on the back of it there. Mm. So that that is a smallmouth killer in the fall. When they start pulling them docks out now, that is something, if I'm not on them real good on docks or whatever, I'll fish out off the points and and stuff like that. And I catch a lot. And yeah, when last does... year I had a 70 fish day on one of them. Seriously? Smallmouth, yeah. Jeez, that's freaking amazing. Yeah. And um, is it much of a topwater lake? Yeah. Um, topwater can be really good, especially in the morning. If, when we fish tournaments, I have kind of had a loop I run of my places that we would hit. One of the first places I always would go to is that island. One reason was it was when you have two young boys in the boat, their nerves are through the roof as soon as you blast off. So it was an open water place. It got them calmed down. And usually right there is two of my favorites. <laughs> I mean, that's how simple I keep it. I either have a bone collar whopper plopper and that's the 90 size. 90 or six, okay. Yeah, or black. It's that that simple to me, and it depends on what the sun's like. But we pull into that island, and most of the time they could catch a fish off of it. As soon as them kids put a fish in a, in a live well, their nerves start calming down. Then we could pull into the docks, and the nerves are off a little bit. They had a couple fish in the boat, and and that helped a lot. But yeah, we I love top water. I mean, everybody does. But the frog this year, I did really. I had a lot of good bites on the frog i was surprised that's something newer to me i'm still learning i went to this z-man frog that's the softest frog i've ever found mm-hmm. now that has had the best hookup ratio of any frog i've thrown yet i've had that one, and then this is a jackal to care i think is the name of it something like that and i mean even if huh. you squeeze them you can feel the difference in them but that frog i mean you can see how <laughs> chewed up it is and that softness is so important with that or, or opening the hooks up a little bit depending if you're fishing in open water because you're right just to get a good hook in them it, it can be frustrating but then again you can also catch the the kicker uh, yeah by throwing that so it's such a weird like yeah there's some tournaments one up there on frogs I really mean, they're not going to tell you that but yeah there's and, and these this is not like Lake Gunnersville, matted vegetation, is it? Or is it more of open water frog fishing? It's a lot of matted. There's some matted vegetation in there. Like if you go back, um, like into Thousand Acres and stuff, there's some matted out stuff that I catch them on back air and stumps. Oh, wow. And the stuff on there. Um, But I catch a lot of them along docks, open water, surprisingly, on there. But typically how I'll fish it, you'll hit these coves and you'll have dock, 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 dock. I'll clear down one side and you hit about two foot of water. And there ain't no more docks right in the back of that. 
Well, these frogs, you can launch them a mile. And that's one reason I like a topwater walking bait also. Problem with the plopper, especially if you throw anything much bigger than like the 90, you throw that thing and you're in 8, 10, 12 inches of water, that thing hits, dies, and it fouls all the time. And little, the littlest, slightest thing in this thing will foul, and then it's just rolling as it comes mm -hmm. back to you. But with the walking bait, you can get away with it. And then that's led to the frog. I like a frog I can throw a mile. Oh, it skips so well, too. It's Yeah, that boy I fish with, Fish Stick, he'll skip them a lot. But I haven't seen that as a need so much. It's more of an open... I mean, I'm not really... So you're not skipping underneath the dock. You're just I, the corners and stuff. Along the sides a lot. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the frog on there. Um, yeah, if I put something under a dock, it's going to be a jig. <laughs> so the other thing you have on there, which I really want to get into, because you're talking about docks, is stick worms and really the approach for using a stick worms. Because you have, like, again, I think the Nico yeah. rig is big right now. There's the flick shake. There's the boring old wacky worm, which I guess is just so lame now. Yeah. And then a then the Texas rig. Like, do you have a yep. specific one that you've had a lot of when success with? When you're saying with? flipping in the frog bite, I found out I can catch just, I can catch him fish on a weightless Senko, the same place I can catch them on a frog for the most part. I can Texas rig a Cinco and I can catch them in eight or nine out of them same 10 that bass that bite, I'm gonna put them in a boat. Mm. That's that's the difference. Um, as far as a wacky rig Cinco, I throw it some. The problem with the wacky rig Cinco is every single boat on Deep Creek has a wacky rig Cinco. So you're competing against that. That's why I try to go to something different such as a jig, an old trip, you know, and it works for me. How how easy do these fish get pressured? Because I'm thinking like this, like comparatively, like if we talk about like Lake Anna, which is about 9,000 acres, this is almost, this is less than half the size of yeah, it. it's 3,900 acres. And you have tournaments and stuff, and you think everyone's throwing a jig or a wacky worm or something like that. Um, do these fish get highly turned off to certain baits? And then yes. how long do you give a bait before you make a switch? Let's say you, for the day, you start with a jig. How okay. long do you give the jig before you make make a switch? First of all, don't ever give up on the jig. Well, there we go. <laughs> that is that conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will switch quickly. Being on Deep Creek, it's crazy because there's a bazillion docks, but out of them, I have my core group that this dock, eight out of 10 times, I'll catch fish off this. Eight out. So if I hit two or three of them key areas and it's not producing, I'll give it an hour or so okay. on there and I'll make a switch. I might, color change ain't a big thing either. They're going to, I don't want to say I force feed them, but you can see most everything is a green pumpkin brown base pattern. Green pumpkin, brown blue. I have boxes here. I mean, I've got crazy through the years, and I make all these crazy. You sit through the winter and you watch all these videos, and they're like, "Oh, Randy blocks like oh, they black and chartreuse." That's just the so I make them, and I'll throw that thing ten times, and I'll be like, I don't have the confidence in it. It's so much about its confidence. Yeah, it really so is. I'm back to the basics on there, of. Um, but yeah, how long do I give a lure? Um, depends on what that lure is. Um, if I go top water and I hit a couple key areas and I'm not catching them on a popper, I'm done with it on there. Um, yeah, so how long I give it, that's, that's so hard question to answer is depends on, are we, if, if somebody's in the back of the boat and I'm just getting thumped, that mm -hmm. happened that day with this Mr. Trout. I thought, the boy that fished with us, Joe, we were down there at that Rollins. He had 10,000 jerk baits. He got this one over. I was like, that's not one I would pick. Same thing the day my wife, I opened the box up and said, pick one. She picked that perch one out. I would not have been throwing that. She caught that big one. You know, so to think you know everything in fishing, you're a fool. So, and yeah. then I fish a jerk bait very, very aggressively. She's back there just barely twitching this thing and got smoked but the cool thing was that was with the live scoop I, I seen that fish I knew it was in there I kept seeing it and told her the general area to cast and she ended up catching it but, okay you got live scope that means we have to have that conversation yeah I didn't want to go down this path but why not I mean everyone loves it on social media so uh, uh yeah. yeah live the scope topic. I mean I I you learn so much from it first off like yes. it's insane what you can learn you have to understand that I had to make the decision this year if you see my boat like I said it looks like a pirate ship my carpet is destroyed my seats have duct tape all over them I have an old 96 Ranger 461 it just it's has a, life experience is what you should call yeah, it yeah yeah but she's an old man once told me he said when you die your bi your Bible and your boat better be wore out or you didn't live a good life <laughs> so that's yeah so she's wore out 
but we had the money put back and I was going to get my seat tree done and carpet put in and the slide scope come up and it just kept eating at me. I was like, new seats and carpet don't put more fish in the boat. So I ended up, I bit the bullet. I called the bass tank. Those people are awesome. A shout out really? to them. Yes. That place, the service from the bass tank. If you're going to buy a live scope, call them. It was amazing. And I, so guys, if you don't know, they're out in Oklahoma. I believe they're run by John Sucra, the bass John tank. Suckup. John Suckup. John Suckup. Yes. I'm terrible with names, guys. Yep. You want to hear me butcher stuff? Yep. Tune into my other channel, Spirits and Ghost Stories for that episode. John Suck, Sucup. 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 Yep. Again, apologize, sir. Now, yep. but they're in Oklahoma, so you didn't drive your boat there, right? No, no, no. I called them, and I'm telling you, I was on the phone. To me, this was a major purchase. I got three grand in this thing, you know, whatever. And that was the biggest fishing purchase I've ever made, <laughs> including my boat, because mm -hmm. that's another story. But anyhow, the, they were incredible. I ended up getting the exact same unit, the salesman there. His name was Austin. The guy is amazing. He t helped, was teaching me. I, he's like, I'm going to tell you what to do. When you get this thing, you call me back. He's like, get out on the water and call me back. I get out on the water. Th the phone rings twice. It ain't like you get put on hold. Phone rings twice. It's him. You know, I'm like, holy wow. crap. You know, tremendous service. He's like, what's your water look like? What's your temperature? He's like, how? And he's like, you have to understand, like, if we went to Mount Storm Lake where it's gin clear and there's no debris in the water or nothing like that, your settings are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But... So they, yeah, he held my hand, walked me through the learning. He, the, the learning curve with it went through the roof. And then what I seen and what I've done with the thing, and I am kindergarten level, I'm sure, to what these guys on the pro tour have and can do with theirs. Because you have to realize they had this thing before it was ever even known about. I mean, Scott Martin had this thing years ago. He even said that before it was even known about prototypes, and they were using it against guys that didn't even know it existed. You know, and then it, once it, I've yeah. seen what it can do and what the potential of it. Now, when I'm in skipping docks or you're frog fishing, you can turn the thing off. It's useless. But early spring, I have one. I caught a 514 and I watched him eat the jerk bait. Oh, it, it was crazy. That's it a big crazy. <laughs> I mean, and then I caught that thing. I could show you. It's out off a place we call Chicken Point. Big long point comes out way out in the middle of the lake but i know there's a weed bed out he slayed a weed bed out there so i pull in there and i start looking around and i'll see nothing i see finally i point out towards the deeper water and next thing man i see a big man that's a big fish things like 35 foot from the boat launched the jerk bait that mr trout jerk bait i jerk it down and i can see that jerk bait on there the closer you get the boat there that beam goes so it's darting kind of in and out of the beam and i'm catching glimpses of it about that time i see you know, I just see this, he's nosing up and it was total video game fishing. And I seen him nose up and he, when he stopped, I just a couple of little, and I mean, bam, rod loads up. It was a 514 largemouth. Now, do you use that at all on that nuclear powered lake, Mount, Mount Storm? Some, I've only fished that a couple of times this year. As soon as the water warms up anywhere else, nobody fishes that thing other than the people that live up there. And then they'll have some club tournaments up there, like Kaiser Bass Anglers, Cheat Lake Bass Anglers. They'll have tournaments up there. So you won't go year round. Then you'll, yeah. you'll winterize the boat then at some point? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, most of the time, it's a warm up. Everybody's ch chomping at the bit. It's been all winter long. And that's the first place you can get on usually because the water there. I mean, when we was kids, we'd go up there in October, November swim. I mean, it, it's crazy oh, wow. hot, the water. It's the discharge water off of that plant. It's the water is 70, 80 degrees wow. a lot of times. Holy year smokes. Around. Yeah. And uh, so that's really stunned the ecosystem, I believe, in there. And the fish are stunned. You just don't ever hear or see a big one come out of there. Now, they have striped bass in there. There's some monster striped bass, um, walleye in there. I've seen a walleye tournament one day, and every single boat had their limit. And I don't know that there was one over 16 inches. That's crazy. It, yeah, I mean, they're in there, but all the fish are, other than them straight bass, there's some big catfish in there, I've heard. But, but it, it still gives you the opportunity because we're, you know, where you guys are, you're so far up north where, yeah, you're iced out everywhere else. So it yeah. does give you that opportunity. It's nice to go and get bit and tune up and get the boat running. And So then you know. now that we're entering, getting closer and closer to ice in, where are you going to be really giving your time between now and the end of the season? Is it going to be Deep Creek? And if it is Deep Creek, like what what presentations are you going to be using this With time the year? weather we got coming next week, I'm probably done for this year on there. Um, we ha I have the John boat and stuff. I'll winterize my big boat. We'll take the John boat and I'll go either to Broadford or Savage Okay. on there. Um, I like Savage. It's 
where it's at is down off the mountain we call it it's a little lower elevation it's usually a little warmer five to ten degrees warmer down there the air temperature and it's loaded with smallmouth and smallmouth are usually typically easier to catch in that colder water okay gotcha yep. gotcha that makes a lot of sense i mean yep. jason we've covered a lot of things have we have we missed anything that we need to oh, goodness, that we need I to could pick be on? here for for days and days but, <laughs> um i really appreciate jake's hosting this and, no no and anybody no that ain't been here it's an amazing shop i mean they got the, the good stuff no i, yeah, I so. sir i'm so glad you reached out to me again guys you know i the reason fishing dmv was created was really trying to like unify all the different tribes of anglers together under one roof so we could really have a basically a, a fish talk show for our area and so if you're a local stick that wants to come on the show just reach out email me we'll try to get you on the show just so you can pass on your knowledge and really hype up these areas because if we don't know about these areas you know we can't get more funding to go to them um that's the one thing i've I've heard from like the virginity and our if you have a bunch of lakes and one never gets any press coverage why are they gonna throw money at it so you need to have the ability to to highlight and promote this place because example is if you creek comes to like the the world's best pike fishery there's a lot of money that's going to go there and it's going to hype that thing up which is a positive of this um but i definitely want to get you back on the show especially in the springtime to kind of like bring back into the yeah, spring we bass season water as well. or something and i would i, I love that'd that be too. great anybody that's interested i mean look me up on facebook um and i hope to and i will be starting my own channel this spring and guys, as soon as he starts the channel, that link will be on my my community tab too. So his YouTube channel will be there, and a link to his yep. Facebook uh, if you want your Facebook yeah, page. Yep. Okay, before I just because yeah, there's some weirdos the, out there. Anybody so. has questions or interested in coming to our area, shoot me. So a that link will be in the episode in. description I'll be as glad well. Glad to answer any questions or a lot of days I have an empty seat. Take anybody. So. Awesome, sir. Well, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Again, guys, please like and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out with the algorithm. We are the fastest growing fishing and outdoor show in the greater D.C. metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.